50 years ago, I started coaching in an orphanage. I saw Morgan as a coach that knew exactly what he was doing and had the respect of the young kids that he was coaching. He personified winning, and he did whatever it would take within the rules to win. He's shown all of us, you know, college coaches, high school coaches, the meaning of commitment. As players changed, you know, Morgan was able to coach whatever the situation was. Through the years, I've been surrounded by some of the greatest young student athletes. And every kid who's played for him has had, had a scholarship. In my opinion, there's no better basketball coach anywhere at any level than Morgan Wooten. As a coach, Morgan Wooten has always displayed a very calm demeanor. His best attributes are his ability to maintain his poise and control in the heat of battle. Very reassuring qualities for his team. But it was that easygoing nature and calm demeanor that made it difficult for most people to detect in 1996 that Wooten was engaged in the biggest battle of his life. Way out the ball, way out the ball, way out the ball, way out the ball, that's it. He knows he's through. In the offseason, right this is what Coach Wooten loves. Each summer, he get and his get family low. retreat low. to the mountains of Emmitsburg, right, Maryland low. for their annual yeah, basketball camp. And for years, much. Coach has used his summers Hard to teach right. thousands of boys the, the fundamentals of basketball. In 1996, it would be Morgan Wooten and his family who were going to learn a lesson, not about basketball, but about life. We had had breakfast, Joe, Morgan, and myself, and then they went left for camp. I was at my camp in uh, July of 1996, and um, I know I just finished lunch and I was getting ready to go down for the orientation with the coaches, and I left a little early, and uh, as I walked out the door, I said, gee, I just feel terrible. Coach Wooten was in an unoccupied section of the campus when the unthinkable happened. I went into the bathroom and uh, Coach Wooten was in one of the stalls. He was just sitting there resting. Seth Schaefer, who played for Jack Bruin, who was one of my dad's closest friends, who has since has passed away, um, came in and said, Joe, there's something wrong with your dad. And I heard heavy breathing, and then I heard it stop. I ran back down the hallway, and he was in the bathroom. So I realized something was wrong. I wasn't sure what. And the first thought I had was that he was dehydrated, because I knew that was one of the problems. He had fainted when I opened the door. I you know, said, are you OK? And his eyes were open. Then he just sighed and rolled his eyes back. And so he was out. He was out. And then he kind of woke up, and we got water, a wet cloth on him. We then called the paramedics, and, and people started to come in. And when the, the ambulance came, at first he was kind of in and out. But um, there was something definitely going on. I was in the ambulance when we were going to the hospital, and uh, right when we were about to pull, we were in, in Emmitsburg, Maryland, we were going to the Gettysburg Hospital. We pulled off to the side of the road because his uh, they couldn't get any uh, signals on him at all. I guess they flatlined with the term they had. It. I knew he had been on one medication which could have dehydrated him, so when Carol called and said, Dad's collapsed, I very innocently took her for her word. And I think initially that was how they felt. But uh, when I got, so I drove, put some things in a suitcase. I said, well, I'll spend the night, and I drove one up to Gettysburg. So we get to the hospital, and um, you know, he talked to us for that first hour, um, and uh, you know, and it was almost like he was very tired, like an exhaustion he had. The minute I went into the emergency room, and he was, you know, definitely uh, hemorrhaging, and very seriously ill. All the buzzers went off, and about 12 medical staff rushed in. I knew that I wanted him to get to a a more sophisticated facility. And then they explained to us, well, we can hopefully keep him alive so we can fly him to John Hopkins. They said they, they put him on the helicopter. And I remember going out. Oh, I didn't think there'd be such a bad memory. <laughs> um, and I really couldn't see him, but I kind of said goodbye because they wouldn't let you go. And then um, I went with my sister and her husband. And we made the ride to Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And then we got there. Morgan had primary biliary cirrhosis, a rare liver disease found primarily in women. Morgan knew of his failing condition for years, but he told only his wife. Only my wife knew about it uh, all through those the years, that there's a problem. Starting a little more serious in the 90s, only she knew about it. But then um, we realized that I, I should go on the list for a, for a liver transplant. And they thought I would need one probably in about a year. 
So, um, and that was in May that they told me I had at least a year before I would need it, and yet I end up going down in July. And now, time was quickly running out. Morgan Wooten was dying. Once you place someone on the highest priority, then if there is a liver available in the local area, he should get the highest priority. Hopefully, we expect to get a liver in the next couple of days, and we may be able to save his life. Tuesday, they thought there was possible liver, and then that turned out it was not an acceptable organ. And uh, then I guess we got word later that there was a possible organ. It was a perfect match, and Morgan Wooten was given a second chance at life. They had said it could be eight or ten hours. So I'm, you're just saying mentally, I've got we got to keep moving through this day. And we got back, and they said the organ is in place and it's functioning. It was just like, I mean, we're all dancing around, you know. It was just wonderful. After a successful liver transplant, Morgan Wooten was determined to meet the family of the donor who saved his life. And so I contacted the people at Hopkins, and they said, well, what you can do is you can write a letter, just address it to the donor family, and you send it to us. We'll see that they get it, and if they want to respond, then that's up to them. So I wrote, I wrote a letter, and obviously, they responded, being fortunate to get a donor, Rochelle McCoy, a mother, 33 years old, who passed away, and for me to be the recipient of her liver, and that's the only reason I'm here today, no other reason. So a meeting was arranged up at John Hopkins, and uh, Kathy and I went up. We thought it'd be best just Kathy and I the first time. And um, we went up, and uh, Ray was there with the two twins. They greeted each of my family members that were in attendance with a handshake and a hug. And, uh, it's, it's pretty touching, it really is. And I walked in and, and I shook his hand and, and I, gave, I gave the twins a big hug and they gave me a big hug. And we sat down, we had a, a meeting for about two hours, it was wonderful. Obviously God must have wanted me to continue doing something, uh, even if it's to make people aware of the need to be, a, to be an organ donor, that they can save a lot of lives when they leave this world just by sharing that decision with their family and their friends, they'd like to be a donor. And uh, maybe that's the reason he said, made sure I stayed to, to spread the word on something like that. But um, I've, it's been my observation over long years of teaching and coaching and growing up in some fashion that there's always a reason for what God has in mind.